Yay. This is going to turn out for a beautiful day in there. Cool. All right. So it's about 15 seconds behind. And Nick, that sounds like a lot of extra noise on the YouTube site. I don't know. Are you getting a lot of? <coughs> okay. The uh, house mic is off. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. It's gorgeous night, May. Next week, Jennifer Van Oss from Animal and Dairy Sciences will be here. Uh, she'll be talking about giving dairy cows a voice through science. And then in two weeks, we're going to find out tomorrow whether the embargo is lifted on a paper on, uh, from the Ice Cube Neutrino folks. And if it's lifted, then we'll have them speak. And if not, I've got a couple of folks who are queued up and ready to go. And I'll let you know tomorrow afternoon uh, who the speaker will be. And so thanks for that. I think that's everything. So now I'll now I start the more formal part. And is your microphone on? I believe so. Good. Yeah. So welcome, everybody, to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Alex Wiedenhoft. He's a... What are you? <laughs> You're a wood scientist, but what's the fancy word? I, I'm a research botanist and team leader. Way to go. And he's with the Forest Products Lab, which is part of the Forest uh, Service, which is part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is part of the U.S. federal government. Wait. Uh, Alex, I get to ask you the five questions. Oh, you're going to talk about wood nerds versus organized crime. How open source do-it-yourself forensic tools can help combat illegal logging. Alex, I get to ask you the five questions. We ask everybody you can answer them in any way that you would like. It doesn't have to be true, it just has to be believable. Alex, where were you born? I was born on Cannon Air Force Base in Clovis, New Mexico. Wow, is that what Clovis Point is named for? I, I don't know, I, I left there when I was an infant, haven't been back. <laughs> and where'd you go to high school? I went to Greendale High School outside of Milwaukee. Excellent, and then where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? I did my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD all in botany here at UW-Madison, which makes me as academically inbred as it's humanly possible to be. Mm. Yeah. No bread like inbred. <laughs> all right. And then uh, did you do any postdocs? No, not, not sort of. See, I, I had my job, and I'm going to talk about this for just a minute or two, in the Center for Wood Anatomy since I was 18 years old. So the whole time I was doing my graduate work, I was also working, and I had other projects that weren't related to my PhD project, so I was kind of de facto doing postdoc-like work at the same time, uh, but I already had my permanent job. And when did you start your permanent job? Uh, officially, I mean, I started working there in April of 1995 as an undergrad. Uh, I didn't start as a research scientist until 2010. Excellent. Just another wave of inadequacy washing over me. I really appreciate that. <laughs> God, that's wonderful. Um, I got to see your uh, stuff at the open house that the Forest Products Lab had on Earth Day back in April. It was the first one that they'd had in a while. I was delighted. It snowed because, you know, Earth Day. Uh, I think this is going to be great for everybody who likes trees and wood and plants and all this great stuff. Really appreciate it. Uh, would you please join me in now welcoming Alex Wiedenhoff to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I love this stuff. I love what I do. I love my job. I'm always excited about it. I hope that it won't bore you. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, all we're shooting for is not being bored. Um, 
The Forest Products Lab is at the west end of campus. Um, it's the United States National Research Laboratory for Wood and Wood Products. We're the only laboratory in the Forest Service that actually spans the, that has a purview that spans the entire country. Most of the other labs are regional labs, the Rocky Mountain Research Station, the Southern Research Station, etc. And because our purview is the entire nation, it means that some of us, especially the botanical types, have to actually have an international purview in what we look at, because as a country, we import a lot of wood and have, even from the early days in 1910 when the lab first formed, it was recognized right away that we needed people who knew about woods from all around the world, not just North American woods. We have one of the largest and arguably the finest research wood collection in the world. This is in the building, uh, the big funky looking building. It looks like a five-year-old stacked Legos on top of them and each other to make a weird rectangular lumpy uh, brutalist period architecture building. That's where we are. And uh, the wood collection is actually quite beautiful. Um, it's basically like a scientific collection of little blocks of wood. Uh, it, it, it's not much more complicated than that, really. Um, so that's just a, a sense of, of where we're coming from. We're, because we're at the laboratory, because we have this collection, we're uniquely suited to be able to do forensic work, to be able to try to combat illegal logging. So true or false, illegal logging controlled by organized crime. You kind of know, right, because it was in the title of the talk, which is, I know, it, that was kind of lame. But, but the, the, the thing about this is I've been working on this topic. You know how it's, you know how it's, you're, you're, you're like, it's cool to say that you're interested in something before it became cool. Like, I liked IPAs before everybody else liked IPAs. Or, well, I've been working in combating illegal logging since before it became sexy. Because believe it or not, I'm a plant anatomist by training, but combating illegal logging became sexy at a certain point in time, which, which we'll get to. Um, and, and so all of a sudden, this esoteric, profession. I'm, I'm just a glorified microscope attachment, right? My expertise is looking at plants under the microscope. And so all of a sudden, what I do and have always done for a living became important. And so I found out I was doing this work and I was on the phone with somebody in DC and I was saying something, well, you know, with illegal logging, it's not like these are bad people. These are just local people trying to make a living. And they said, uh, for somebody who knows a lot about wood, you obviously don't know anything about illegal logging. And that's when I was exposed to the literature that this stuff is, in fact, controlled by organized crime. And the groups that are moving wood are typically also moving wildlife, illegal drugs, narcotics, weapons, human beings. The same boat might have all of these things on them. And these are real criminal networks. Illegal logging associated with uh, the deforestation associated with illegal logging is about 17% of global carbon emissions when you look at carbon cycles and between half and 90% of the export volume from key tropical countries is illegally logged material which means that's up to about a third of the global timber market is illegally logged mm -hmm. and that's on the order of greater than a hundred billion dollars a year these are some 2017 transnational crime numbers. You can see at the top counterfeiting about a trillion dollars. Drug trafficking about what 500 and 500 600 billion dollars. Illegal logging is in this range of 52 to 157. So really it's number 4 cuz human trafficking should be bumped above it. So if you sum up the value of all other major transnational crime they are not equal to the value of illegal logging. It is the fourth most lucrative form of transnational crime in the world. So one of the questions then is, how does wood become illegal? I mean, you've got to, I mean, here's a block of wood. This is not an illegally logged piece of wood, but th here's a block of wood. How can this become illegal? And we have a couple of different ways. We can worry about the species. Is it a protected species? Is it an endangered species? We can ask questions, where did it come from? Was this a tree cut down in a national park or in a national forest or a protected area, a forest reserve, someone else's land? Any of those things could make it illegal. Did you have permission to cut 10 trees, but you cut all the trees? That would make the harvest illegal. 
did you use a method like complete clear cutting or did you maybe you had to not build roads do selective logging all these different criteria if you don't meet those rules then the entire harvest can be illegal timing of harvest can be important it, in in certain in certain ecosystems you can't be going in with heavy equipment when the ground is thawed because you'll crush the root systems of adjacent plants and you'll have a lot of, of forest death uh, I already mentioned road building and then paperwork failures. You didn't pay your taxes. You didn't have permission to be there in the first place. All of these things are ways in which wood can become illegal. Most of them we don't have science to test. I can't get out my hand lens and look at paperwork. I can actually put the paper under the microscope and tell you what kinds of wood it's made out of, but that doesn't help us figure out whether or not it has the appropriate stamp on it. So the other thing for wood to become illegal move that out of the way a little there have to be laws and so the first one I want to talk about and we're going to cycle back to this in a little bit is CITES the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species this is an international treaty signed in 73 took effect in 1975 and it has a an ever-growing and changing list of individual species genus specific epithet exactly this species is protected mahogany protected. The rosewoods, protected, but listed by scientific name. The other one that I want to talk about is the Lacey Act Amendment. This is when being a wood anatomist became sexy, 2008. That was, that was kind of the peak. Now we're, we're on the downward slope again. But in 2008, we amended the Lacey Act, which was originally a wildlife protection act that from the, from the turn of the previous century where Senator Lacey wanted to they were having a problem with poaching out west and with other wildlife crime in the western US and people would be in one of the western territories they'd kill a mountain lion they'd take it back to Manhattan and have it stuffed to put in their sitting room and if they made it out of Montana let's say then they were free and clear so they made a law that basically federalized the interstate traffic in wildlife. Later it was extended to fish. Later even then it was extended to other countries' animals. You can imagine with, the, with, with how uh, inefficient, let's say, I think that's polite, with how inefficient Congress is right now, can you imagine if we had to pass a law for this rhinoceros and that elephant and the zebra and this, and, and all, we can't do that, right? Though we're not part of the range states for those animals, so the Lacey Act covered then animals from any country if they're taken in contravention of local law. In 2008, that was extended to the plants to, excuse me, to plants and plant products, including wood. And if you like, so I'm part of the US government, right? I'm, I work for the US Forest Service. So it's, it's like, um, you know, like if you grow up in an Italian family, you're allowed to make fun of Italians. Um, because I'm a federal employee, I get to make fun of the federal government a little bit. In true governmental fashion, the 2008 Lacey Act Amendment was the 2007 Combat Illegal Logging Act. It just took that long to actually make it happen. And so, timber harvested anywhere in contravention of local law then is illegal when it enters the U.S. and then as it crosses state lines. So, we have illegal logging. We have laws and a framework in which to enforce these things. Why care? Why does this matter? Well, the United Nations Environmental Program and Interpol in 2012 did a big report about illegal logging because again, this is a hundred billion dollar a year problem globally. These are, these are drug lords and human traffickers who are making money on this. The Sierra Leone Civil War was funded in part from illegal timber. Uh, Khmer Rouge back in the Vietnam era was funded with illegal timber. Uh, Charles Taylor's Liberia, major parts of the funding for some of the oppressive parts of that regime, illegal timber. So it's not just even gangsters only, but also government people as well. So they came through and they said, we basically need to have a nerd arms race. We need forensic tools that are capable of tracking this timber, identifying this timber, such that the smugglers can't get away with it. 
So what does that mean for us? The United Nations called and said, we need, you know, would nerds of the, of the world unite? We need science solutions to these problems. So this is our team, and we have to fight the gangsters. So how do nerds fight gangsters? It's not sweet kung fu moves. How do nerds fight gangsters? Science, science. absolutely. Always science. But in this case, specifically forensic wood signs. But before we talk about that a little more, it's fair to ask the question, OK, so we have illegal logging. It's mostly in tropical countries. Why should, should, do we need to care about that in the United States? And I promise you, I'm not going to give big, long, like, research talks, but this is a paper that we published in 2019, which, so, OK, let me back up. I go everywhere with my hand lens, which means when I'm standing in line at a store or if I'm at the lumber yard or whatever, I've got a hand lens, I've got a sharp knife, and I identify things because that's what I do for a living, among other things. So, like, there's not a tool handle in Home Depot I haven't identified along the way. And so, um, I knew for a fact for 20 years that we have a huge problem in this country with our forest products sold to us in the stores not being what it was claimed. But no one had ever shown it before. So we did a study with World Wildlife Fund, World Resources Institute, where keeping everything blind, they went out and went to top 100 retailers and bought normal people wood products. Not $10,000 rosewood beds, nothing crazy, just normal stuff people would get sawed off little chunks so that we couldn't even tell what the product was from with a code on it, and we made microscope slides and figured out what the woods were. Then we reported back to them. Then they told us what the claim actually was. And so what we found in this study is more than half of all wood products are not the kind of wood they say they are. Incorrect botanical claim, incorrect botanical identification. 21% are lying about whether or not it's solid wood versus a veneer over MDF or even you know, plastic over MDF, things like that. And 13%, they were both wrong. So half, more than half of everything that we see is wrong in the stores across a wide range of retailers. So I would argue that that means that we probably should worry about that in this country. Even if we don't have a huge problem with illegal logging in our own forests, we do, by virtue of our consumerism, export illegal logging to other places, right? We export by, by demand. We essentially pay other people to do this. One of the things that we learned in this study also is we did a survey of the ability of other laboratories to identify wood correctly. And one of the things that we found out of the few people, this is a little bit salty, but of the few people <clears throat> that were willing to put their money where their mouth is and take the proficiency test, the highest score was 92% when grading very liberally. The lowest score was 6%. These were university places teaching wood identification, consultants charging money for wood identification. So we've determined we do not have forensic capacity in this country to tackle this problem of looking at timber trade. So the idea is to develop tools, forensic wood science technologies, that enable people who want to follow the law, enable them to be able to comply with the law. If I make some really complicated law and tell you you have to follow it, and then you're like, I have no, I, what am I supposed to do with that, right? We have to, we can't do that. We have to be reasonable about it. If we want people to follow the law, we have to give them a path to do it. We have to empower them to be able to do it. It'd be like posting speed limits, but taking speedometers out of your car. But then I'm going to give you a ticket because you're going too fast. That doesn't make sense, right? So we want to make it so easy to be good and so easy to catch bad guys that only bad guys actually break the law. That's kind of the overarching goal. And to do that, we have to actually look at the underlying variability for forensic wood science. So we're t I talked about you know, different ways things can become illegal. It, the paperwork could be illegal. You could have cut down too many trees. If 
This is, like I said, this is not illegally logged. But if you were, if you were handing this to me and you said, did this come from a clear-cut operation? I have no way of determining that. Did they sign form 1094-76C? I have no way of knowing that from a block of wood. All we can know with the wood is the variation inherent in it. So we have two sources, structural variability, molecular variability. Structural variability is my specialty, right? I'm a plant anatomist. Traditional wood identification with a microscope, traditional wood identification with a hand lens, computer vision wood identification that we're going to talk about, and as I mentioned before, fiber testing. I can, I can put paper under the microscope and tell you what kind of tree it came from. On the molecular side, there are chemical fingerprinting techniques. There's near-infrared spectroscopy that they use to try to identify different woods. There's stable isotope chemistry to determine where a tree grew. So let's say, for example, uh, Siberian oak, which is protected, is being brought into the United States and sold as white oak flooring. Well, Siberia has a very different distinct isotopic signature to that of a North American oak. So with stable isotope chemistry, that's actually uh, technically quite feasible. And, and I don't want to say that it's easy. It's not easy. None of, none of this stuff is actually that easy. But it's, it's doable, right? And then there are DNA barcoding. That's species level identification. That's the idea that we could get certain snippets of DNA and have this big database and be able to know based on the sequence that, oh, that's this species. Oh, that's that species. Almost like scanning a barcode at the grocery store. That's the idea. Turns out in plants, it's not that easy. DNA fingerprinting, just like we talk about with human beings. Individual matching. Can we match this tree to that stump in the national forest or in the protected area? Phylogeography is using DNA sequence information, DNA variation uh, in the context of geography to understand where something came from. So it's another one of these, it's another technique like stable isotopes to determine provenance. And then qPCR, kind of like COVID testing things. Now, one thing that's important is we make a big distinction in my lab and in my group and the people that I work with between field deployable technologies, field deployable science, and laboratory-based science. And because we're trying to combat illegal logging, I at least am of the belief, I have this idea, I believe, I, I, I'm, you know, I believe it pretty firmly, that we're going to do more to protect the forests the closer we can get our monitoring technology, our tracking technology, to the actual forests. Obviously, if somebody's already cut the tree down and shipped it to the United States and we catch it at the border, the tree's already dead. There's value in doing that, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to get progressively farther up that supply chain to be more likely to cause financial harm to the people doing this to make them try to find some other way to make a living. That's part of the idea. So there are a couple different approaches. One of the ones is the field manuals. I've written, it's very, it's, I, okay. I say it's funny, and it's only Alex funny, okay? And I know that, so I'm fine with that. Um, but. I, I, I did the CITES manual, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. And then, uh, and then I did this Central American manual, which I'll talk about in the next slide also. And, I, and that came out in 2011, the second one. And I said, I am never doing another one of these books again. And then we did the Ghana manual. And then my, my good colleague and friend said, hey, let's do a revised second super expanded edition of the Central American manual. So then we did that. And I did a timber bridge. So I swore off writing books like this in 2011, and obviously I failed. So, um, but that's one of the things. It's, that's, that's about as old school as it gets. An actual physical book that you take out in the field, and you have a sharp knife and a hand lens, and you look at features of wood, and go through an, a, a dichotomous key to figure out what the wood is. That's as old school as it gets. Training and education, I'm sorry, the training and education, uh, also going around the world and teaching classes on how to do this. The various xylo projects that I'm going to explain in a minute, and then we've been doing, we've been using DNA technology, kind of like the rapid PCR testing for COVID, for specific wood species. Not, I'm just mentioning that kind of in passing because it's because it's cool, and you, everybody should just kind of know that that's possible in the back of your mind. But I'm going to take a quick sip of water because I need to. 
Sorry. I get going and then, you know, my mouth dries out. So, the CITES manual saga. This is when I was telling you that I was doing this stuff since before it was cool to do this. In 1999, the Canadians, Environment Canada, and CITES came to my mentor and myself and said, can you develop a field manual, this old school technology, for CITES protected timbers? And so we said, yeah, and it came out two years later in English, French, and Spanish, later translated into Polish and Chinese, distributed to 160 countries around the world, and obviously I didn't get my automations right. Nobody cared. Crickets. You could hear them chirping in every language in the, everywhere, everywhere around the world. No one called. Nobody wrote. Nobody thought it was great. Nobody said, hey, good job. I was heartbroken. I mean, 2002, I was 26. I was just a kid, right? I mean, so I'd worked so hard on this for years and came out, and it was, like, so exciting. Nobody cared. Then 2007, we started getting asked to go around and do, and do trainings. So I went to Nicaragua and taught a course, 2007. I went to Honduras and taught a course, 2007. I went to Singapore, 2007, taught one of these CITES courses. 2008, Honduras, excuse me, Nicaragua calls and says, hey, can you come back and teach the course again? And I said, I was just there. As, as, as Tom jokes, plant anatomy hasn't changed any in the last 300 years, so we don't need to do these trainings once a year. They said, well, actually we do. Because when you came, our Sandinista government was just elected. And you trained a bunch of people that weren't hired by Sandinistas. They were the wrong political party. So we fired 29 of the 30 people that you trained. So we want you to come back and train a new group of 30 people. And I love this stuff. And I love teaching. I love Central America. I love Spanish language. I love this stuff. So, so I went back and taught the course. Well, in the meantime, from 2007 to 2008, Honduras had a coup. A bunch of the people I trained were killed. Chief of the Forest Service of, of Honduras, as I understand it, just disappeared. I met with him in that training in 2007, and he's the one that asked for the Central American book, because he said, hey, look, being able to identify the endangered species is great, but we need to identify just our normal day-to-day -day species, just for normal trade, for legal trade, because we need tools to empower compliance, not just for law enforcement, right? We have to have both sides. I'm from the Forest Products Laboratory. I believe in cutting down trees and making things out of wood, right? We should do it well. We should do it intelligently. We should be taking best advantage of the resource and respecting the resource. But if we don't have a monetized... one, I, I, tell, I tell my students, I tell people all the time, I think there are probably two ways to make, well, three ways to make forests stay forests. Just have no people around at all, and that means either just totally depopulate an area or put up a wall and get snipers, or you have to have a way to monetize that forest. It has to have value as a forest, or eventually it gets turned into something else. I don't have solutions to that. No idea how to solve that problem. It's just something worth thinking about. So, Nicaragua, Honduras, Singapore, Nicaragua again, came home and said, wow, I love teaching. I can't train. Well, first off, what were the lessons? One, I don't go to Central America anymore because I'm bad for the region. I stay home. Two, um, I can't train people fast enough to make a difference. There's nothing that I can do. I could, I, I'm a researcher. I'm a, if, if you think of it in university terms, I have a 100% research appointment. So I'm not supposed to be going around the world teaching courses one week at a time, multiple times a year. So we need a technological solution. And that's the genesis of our Xylotron platform. The question being, can we, starting in about 2011, teach a computer to identify wood and do it in a way that we can deploy that in the field? Because again, we're trying to get as close to the forest as we can. So I've got seven slides about the evolution of the Xylotron. And it, it, was, it was very fun putting this together because we started this stuff in 2011 with State Department funding in support of the Lacey Act because the Lacey Act has this requirement when we bring stuff in, when we import, which influences trade relationships with other countries, thus the Department of State, right, because of the international reach. So at first we thought, hey, maybe we can just buy phones, tablets right off the shelf, take pictures of wood, and have it identify wood. And we found that we didn't have the magnification that we need. We couldn't control the lighting of the specimens. 
And the, the hardware itself, just there was no way it was going to be able to do the computations needed in real time. Because if I give you an app, and you have to take a picture, like if you use one of the plant apps, right? And you take a picture of a plant. If you have to wait for 35 seconds, you're not going to use the app. Or maybe you will once, right? I really need to know what this one thing is. But if you're an inspector who has to go to the next thing and the next thing, and you need an answer in like one to two seconds. Anything longer than that, people aren't going to wait for. So it wasn't feasible. So what we decided then is we have, I mean, this is not a joke, none of, none of this, it's funny, but it's not a joke. Um, we needed to control the lighting, control the magnification, control the actual camera side of things. When you use a smartphone, everybody here is, is, are all like fully fledged adults. So, so you remember a time before, like when you used to use film cameras, right? I used to shoot film all the time as a kid, and I really enjoyed it. And, and you know, you get good film, you get good printing, you get good rich color. Then the first digital cameras came out, and they took these sad, washed out, colorless pictures, right? And then they got better and better over time because my cell phone is filled with thousands of tiny magical elves making pictures beautiful. So that when I take a picture of my kids or I take a picture of a flower, it looks like what I see. That picture looking like what I see with my eyes is not science. That's art. And, that's, and it's all proprietary. So we don't know what they're doing to the scientific information. So we have to control that too. So we have to use a scientific grade camera. So this is the lens here and the camera here for the inside of a xylotron. This was the pipe bomb version. We were trying to make this as cheap as possible anywhere around the world, simple materials. So we had, uh, it fitted into, it, the, uh, the, the intervening PVC is gone so you can see some of what's going on. Um, this was a spectacular failure, this didn't work. Um, we were allowed, we were able to adjust the focus, but one of the problems is as soon as you give people the ability to change something, they change it and then they can't put it back again. It's like Humpty Dumpty. So that became, we had to, I mean, you know, we use the phrase idiot proof everything, right? We, we had to try to make it as, as standalone, functional, rugged as possible. This was not the answer. Then we tried, well, what if we, what if we bought an existing mag light, the big cop flashlights, and used that? Because that's, you know, it's already there. They're like $20, that's a, that's a good shell to put everything in. But again, that focuses, that changes, that's hard to fix, that's hard to control. And um, there wasn't actually a lot of room inside the handle to get the wires and the, the, everything to get the lighting right. So then we had this really awkward cage design um, with bolts and again, trying to get stuff that you can go to the hardware store to build one of these. Obviously the camera you just have to buy from the company, the lens you have to buy. But for all the rest of it, can, can we use simple materials? Then we had aluminum tubing. Uh, we had not actually this lens, we had a different lens that was inadequate. And it was so difficult to calibrate this because each of these four legs are controlled by like, little bolts and lock bolts and it's very fussy, not great. And so that took us through 2011. Then about 2012, we landed on an early version of the, the Xylotron 1.0. This gives us visible light bouncing off the specimen, collects that light with a really high quality lens, puts it into a good scientific quality camera, spits it out to us. Um, mechanically, not a great design. We had a lot of load bearing on, on screws into plastic through stainless steel. It just didn't make a ton of sense. That was published open source in 2019. Then, right around that time, the Forest Stewardship Council in the European Union, I was doing a big project uh, with the Forest Stewardship Council using forensic wood anatomy to investigate their supply chain to ensure that their products are actually, you know, being, being tracked properly. And they needed, they needed to, do, to be able to do charcoal. Well, the wood structure of, of a normal piece of wood is maintained when it's turned to charcoal. You lose all color information, but all the cells just shrink a little bit. They're all still there. It still looks just like wood. So, like in this case, an A is an example of white oak, B is an example of white oak with the xylotron, C, white oak with the xylotron charcoal in both cases. But what we found out was that when we're imaging wood, we want the lights right up next to the wood. 
it, it lets us, we, we design the lighting array so that we have even illumination. It makes it very, very pretty. That's because we're using differences in color bouncing off the wood. As soon as we're worried about differences not in color, because charcoal is black, this piece, there's no color variation here. There's just cell wall thickness and angle of light that can bounce off. We want to move the lighting array as far away as possible. And so basically what ended up happening was everything was basically the same except that the lighting position was different. So we have basically a $650 camera, a $650 lens, $1,300 to build one xyloscope, and it can only be used for wood or only be used for charcoal. That's stupid, right? It's the exact same material. So in 2020, Xylotron 2.0. Um, I'm a botanist by training, but part of, part of what was nice about COVID was we had a lot of time to work at home, right? So I got to learn 3D design and electronics and all this kind of stuff and, uh, and made a version of the Xylotron now where this white piece right here, this is the lighting array. This is in the charcoal position. It's as far away from the front end of the device as possible. Or you can slide it down into the wood position or any place in between. So now, for the same lens, the same camera, everything, we can do both. We also added UV illumination so that, like a black light, very strong, fry your eyeballs out of your skull black light. Um, but $1,300 just for the xyloscope and then you have to have a laptop. And so as much as I love, oh, and, and then I, I, so this is, this is, that looks basically like a lightsaber and I am a Star Wars nerd, so it, you know, it's not entirely accidental. Um, but, uh, and they all have to be hand built for those, if you're in any Star Wars nerds out there, you know what I'm saying. So, um, so this is what a xyloscope looks like. Stainless steel tube, and then everything self-contained. 3D printed components, and, and then hand soldered and handmade. Then this is the much lighter uh, 3D printed housing. So all the parts are 3D printed, because I got some feedback early on and said, hey, we're having a hard time machining with precision everything that needs to be the little slots that need to be machined and the holes for the screws, and we're, we're, we're struggling with that. So came up with an as yet unpublished um, uh, 3D printed version. So this is the Xylotron then, $1,300. And, and, it's, and it's worth mentioning also that um, my, my good colleague, Dr. Prabhu Ravindran, is the machine learning guy. He's the computer science guy. I'm, I'm a plant anatomist by training. I picked up a little bit of 3D design. I picked up a little bit of electronics by necessity. I tried to write an app completely failed. I'm going to leave that to 16-year-olds who know what they're doing. Um, and uh, and uh, I have no ability whatsoever with, with programming or machine learning or any of that stuff. So that, that part of all of this is taken care of by Dr. Ravindran. Um, so here are a couple, just a couple things. We can, this is just a figure from the paper, we use this tool for wood, but we could use it for anything, anything that has useful macroscopic variation. So this one's plugged in. So when I turn the light on, you can see that light comes out the front of it. And then it has the black light in there, which at this distance won't hurt anybody. But so visible light. So I'm just going to use our first software package. It's just called Xylopeak because uh, it's just for like using it as a glorified hand lens. So what we're going to see here is almost exactly what I see with my hand lens. So let's start with, let's say, the stitching up here. This is fabric of my shirt. And then when we get to the embroidery, we get that level of detail. This is my, these are my pants. And then if you ever want to be really depressed about something, wash your hands like you're scrubbing in for surgery. And then just look at your, oh, my hands are so clean hands. It's, it's ridiculous. So that's, that's skin. So this is just a piece of white paper when the, when the balance is back down, with a little flex of charcoal on it, because it's got charcoal on it. Um, so the, the Xylotron, then, is an imaging device, right? We get visible light. We get UV light. We collect all that. And then we have the image come back. Now, OK. 
Every one of you should own and carry a hand lens with you at all times, okay? I'm a hand lens evangelist. I believe strongly that the, the world is so beautiful just with some magnification, right? Here's a tomato leaf, a very sad one that came off one of the plants today. But you can see, oh, there's a little bug crawling on it, right? Here's a little friend I brought with us. And there are trichome epidermal hairs. You can see that's the underside of the leaf. There's all sorts of stuff you can see. You just, you don't need this. You don't need technology for this. You can just use a hand lens. Um, I, I, I teach uh, here right, at UW, and, uh, and a lot, my, some of my students will not use their hand lens. But if I give them an electronic device, they will look at everything. And if they can take a picture of it and share it with their friends, they're super into it, which it's, it's been interesting to learn. So I'm going to show you now Xyloimph. Xyloimph is imp for inference. This is to identify wood. And what we do to identify wood is we collect a bunch of images of species X, then species Y, then species Z. And we tell the computer, this is the botanist summarizing computer science, um, we tell the computer, go sit in the corner and think about it and come back to me and tell me when you have a good answer, when you have a way to tell a, you know, X from Y from Z. And we use convolutional neural networks and deep learning to do this. Um, and what we get out then is we get a model with, oops, my bad. Here we go. We get a model with a certain number of species. And we, in the models, we call them classes because individual species cannot be separated by wood anatomy. So the individual species of, let's say, poplar, the wood all looks about the same, a populus, like uh, cottonwood. Um, so we can't make species level separations based on wood. So we group all those species into one genus level class, a populus class, right? Um, so this is our Colombian woods model. So to be able to use the xylotron, all you have to do is just set it flat on whatever you want to look at. Now, to be able to use xyloimph, you do have to learn a little bit of wood anatomy. So the thing that makes wood, wood, can you see there are a bunch of diagonal lines parallel to each other? Those lines are called rays. And we have to have them oriented vertically in the image when we shoot the image. So like this now, you see how the lines are vertical now? OK. So if we look at totally different wood, has little tiny rays. Can you see how they're all horizontal right now? We'd need to go 90 degrees to that. Yet a different wood completely. We're kind of diagonal now. We need to get them vertical. Then this is a bunch of ladybugs. Um, do you see any rays? Do you see any parallel lines? That's because this is not wood. This is palm. This is a palm tree stem, and botanically, that's not wood. It's a different tissue. It doesn't have those lines, so we can't orient the lines. So we just have to be able to find the rays and orient them vertically. So this is a model for Colombian woods. And oh, it's worth mentioning. This here is a very sharp saw cut, like, like a scary sharp saw cut. This is a sharp knife cut. You see how much more cellular detail we can see? Saw cut, knife cut, boundary there. The surface I'm using, just to make it easy for me, because um, I, you know, I'm trying to talk and do all this at the same time, has been polished and sanded to a very high degree. So you see, can you see our tiny, tiny little lines running vertically? We've got them good, so I'm going to press I for identify. And that's how long it took for it to come back and to tell us that it thinks that this wood, to a very high confidence, is a wood called cedralinga. It has a 0% chance of being parkia, but if we click on it, we'll get an example image. So the image on the left is the image we just captured. The image on the right is a reference image that's in the software for a human to look at it and go, yeah, maybe not, right? Or vocesia. It's clearly not that one. Yeah, it actually is Cedralinga. This is completely correct. It's very good at identifying Cedralinga. So if I go back to L for live feed, it takes away the image that we just took. Then, oh, I just dropped the specimen. Then 
we can set up a different wood. This wood is called virola, and sometimes it gets it right and sometimes it gets it wrong. But one of the things, so virola, 96% confident that it's virola. It thinks that 3% maybe could be ocotilla. That doesn't look good. 1% could be cedrolinga that we just looked at. That's definitely not right. Now, one of the things that's great, maybe it's terrible about computers, is that they do exactly what you tell them to do. So, so the upside is, with human capacity, we can't train people fast enough. People get promoted, people get fired, people get hit by a bus. So we, don't, we, we, we can't control that piece of it. The computer will do it the same way every single time, no matter what, if you feed it that same image. It never varies. Now, a slightly different image from a slightly different area, you might get a different result. But the program has been told, whatever picture you feed me, I'm going to break down mathematically, compare to the statistics of the model that I've determined, and give you an answer. And it's going to find the best match. So let's just say, for argument's sake, can you see the rays? We've got to get them oriented vertically. This is my shirt, right, just for any, if anybody who can't see. So obviously, it's not made out of wood. It doesn't have rays. Now we're going to tell it, identify. And it came back and it said, oh, I think it's Eschweilera. Well, obviously it's not Eschweilera. Now, are there some kind of textural similarities maybe between those two? Could be. So that's an obvious example. We gave it a non-wood image. It gave us a wood answer. <clears throat> but what if we tried to do a wood that is wood? I think we can all agree. We can see the rays, right, running vertically, the parallel lines, and there are lots of little horizontal wavy lines, but they're not as straight. So this wood is not part of the model. The computer can't get this right because it's never been taught this wood before. It can't be the right answer. But interestingly, it comes back with, this, so this is, it comes back with Kariniana. This is actually Curatari which are like sister genera in the same family, and wood anatomically, they're almost identical. So it can't give us the right answer, but it gave us a darn good wrong answer. That's the same wrong answer we'd get out of a talented human being who didn't know that this other wood existed. So it's pretty cool. Um, so switching back, and for Xylotron 2.0, We've done models for the CITES controlled mahogany family, for Ghana, for Colombia, for Peru, for North America, for charcoal, um, commercial charcoals. And the computer, just like a person, is way more effective if it only has to memorize 20 things at a time versus 200 things at a time. If we, if we try to build a model with 300 different woods, we get very low accuracies because it's too much for the computer to think of all at once. And so just like with, just like with human beings, when I was teaching people how to do the CITES wood identification, how to correctly identify CITES controlled species, they had to learn the CITES species and the things that would most likely be confused with them in trade. Not everything botanically that could look like that, not possible, right? So we have to control the context when we're doing this kind of work. So we go much above 20, 30 woods, and we start to see a drop off in accuracy. And another piece of this, and this kind of makes sense, if I, who have greater expertise than the computer still, we'll, we'll go ahead and knock on wood on that, um, then if, if I can't tell them apart, with the hand lens, and we don't think they're differentiable, then asking the computer to do it's probably not fair. You're because you're going to tell the computer, you know, it, it, never mind. Okay, <laughs> it's like it's like if you never mind. Okay, I I <laughs> sorry, I'll digress and we'll never get done. So 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 the 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 problem only woods that are that are separable should be put into a model. That's just a common sense rule. The other problem with this, though, is that it's expensive, right? Uh, each xylotron is 13, or xyloscope is $1,300, and then a laptop, so it's about two grand a piece. Um, so given that, and given that nowadays, because remember, xylotron 1.0 started in like 2012. 
smartphones weren't that powerful, the cameras weren't that great, it, it, we just weren't where we are now. Uh, and, and once upon a time, only rich people had them. Now, every, basically, everybody's got a smartphone almost anywhere you go now. Any kind of like professional working person has a smartphone. Uh, and so we can count on it. So one of my questions was, can I develop a piece of hardware to control illumination, right? achieve the necessary mag magnification, and be adaptable to like, any smartphone? And that's where the xylophone came from. And this was my COVID baby, along with the, the once we finished the Xylotron 2.0, then the Xylophone was the next challenge. Can we scale this down and therefore scale up the potential? Um, it was, I mean, again, I'm a plant anatomist. I make really nice microscope slides. I don't do great 3D design, and certainly not on the first go. I mean, I, I'm, anyway, I was, I was privileged to be doing this by myself during lockdown so no one could see my shame, okay? <laughs> um, but ultimately we got it done and published it open source, DIY with an extensive assembly manual, which I didn't mention with the Xylotron, which is also true, step by step with photos so that anybody who can solder two wires together can actually do this with no prior training. And we've had, I've had two colleagues at work, um, uh, a, a public affairs person and our new librarian who thought it would be cool to try. And so I taught them how to solder two wires together and gave them the manual and set them to it and they both made their own xylophones. So uh, it is actually doable. And it just uses a commercially available hand lens. It's a $35 lens. So the downside, again, because I mentioned that <clears throat> once upon a time I tried to write an app and I, and I I stopped almost immediately because I realized I was not going to be able to do it. There's no software at this point in 2020 to do anything with it. It's just a piece of hardware that you put on a phone. And you can get images like this. You can get the uh, A is a, a veneer of, or plywood, of uh, oak plywood. B are the developing gills of a portobello mushroom. And if we have any mycologists in the field, the little tiny dots on there are actually developing basidia which is, if you're a mycologist, it's amazing. Um, this is the underside. I, I, I love mycology, so I'm not mocking mycologists at all. I'm just saying that's super cool to be able to see on your phone. Um, this is the underside of a coleus leaf where you can see individual hairs. And this is fabric from just a sports shirt that I had. And so, so we have the hardware, but we don't have the software. So we just recently finished a cooperation between my lab the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organi Organization and the Forest Products Lab in the Philippines to develop an on-the-phone app for the Philippines model, which I guess I didn't list in the previous slide, um, and be able to deploy the models on the phone. And this is an important point. Everybody knows about like the cloud and you can store, you know, store photos in the cloud, you can do all this. All other people that have been trying to do these, solve these kinds of problems with smartphones uh, for wood identification typically employ the cloud. So you take your picture on your phone, you send it to, to basically to Amazon Web Services, which then crunches all the numbers and it spits an answer back to you, which means you need to have 3G, 4G, 5G coverage to be moving that around, which is great if you're in, you know, Miami, but it's at yeah, the port in Miami, but it is not great if you're at a border control point, you know, in, in Puerto Maldonado, Peru, right? Not great. So we want to be able to do everything on device. So I am happy to say, unless I screw this up, I'm going to be able to show you. So we just hijacked. So here's the xylophone. Oh, it's not showing up. Oh, that's terrible. Let me try again. Now it'll work a bit, sorry. There we go. So let's do, so this is the Phil Wood ID, Phil for Philippines, and hit continue, 
capture wood sample down here. The app's a little bit sensitive. There we go. So now we're getting our live feed. So this is, cal this is calibrated for Philippine woods and then also for, for southern pine because for whatever reason they import southern pine from us. So here's our live view on the phone. You can see our, our rays. And again, we have to orient the rays vertically, which I'm going to do. And I'm going to identify the sample. And it comes back, and it says it thinks that it's teak. And this actually is teak. So uh, correctly identifies a wood. Then we do pine. And you can come down here and play with all this stuff when, when everything's done. This is saw cut pine, not much to see. This is the knife cut area where we can see the wood anatomy better. Orient the, okay, I'm sorry, I gotta use the table. I don't have enough hands. And see, it just gave us an answer of rain tree for a black screen, because I accidentally bumped the, the trigger. So here, we get that oriented, identify sample, comes back as Pinus. So the app works fairly well, but honestly, what's more fun is just using this to geek out about stuff. So, so here is a piece of wood. This is black locust. If you guys know black locust, it'll be flowering soon. Um, and we have outer bark at the top, and then there's a little bit of inner bark and then there's a little yellow line of holes. You see that? That's the outermost growth ring, the early wood vessels of that. And then there's wood underneath that that's kind of yellowish. And then wood below that that's dark brown. The dark brown wood is called heartwood. It has extractive chemicals that give it that color. But this is why we put, or I put, UV lights on the xylophone because some woods are fluorescent. The heartwood of some woods is fluorescent. So we have that outer bark, that inner bark, that first little bit of early wood, the sap wood that does not fluoresce, and the freshly cut heartwood, which is bright yellow green fluorescent and beautiful. And we can zoom in to a crazy degree. This is on your phone. This is a much higher magnification than I can actually see with, with just my hand lens. And so this is part of, I mean, this is more fun than the app, honestly. Just being able to take pictures of this stuff is, is really pretty, pretty cool. So being able to just take a picture of whatever you want. I had my colleague has one of these, and he sent me a picture of something he saw at work today, and he sent me a xylophone picture, which was, which was great. There we go. So, just wrap it up here. Quickly, so for teaching, dendrology, plant anatomy, mycology, uh, forensic botany in my class, uh, we, we, we use it in the classroom to let students be able to take pictures of things and zoom in on stuff. Um, general nerding out, it's, it's totally fun. My former assistant director, who was not a botanist, he was an administrative guy and a former Marine, found out about this, thought it was the coolest thing he had heard of in a long time, and, and wanted one for when he goes hiking. So just, just cool. Um, and then research into other materials. Professor Emily Arthur in the art department here used this. She had an exhibit, what, two years ago at, at the Chazen, used this to study the Audubon, in original copies of the Audubon manuals and determine and kind of rediscover what printing and, and illustrating processes were used. And so this is a quote from her um, uh, about being able to use this to rediscover how they actually made Birds of America, which is this iconic publication. Um, and kind of fun, she's, she's on uh, sabbatical in Harvard right now, and, and she's working with some materials that, again, we just put this flat on the surface. Well, some stuff, they're not allowed you, the museum won't let you touch stuff sometimes. So I actually redesigned it and made a non-contact version for her that gives her about four millimeters of working distance so that um, she, can, she can get at some of these materials. 
Uh, my colleague at Oxford, Joanna Ostapkovich, she uses this on wooden cultural patrimony and studies that we do together. She's an expert in uh, the, the, wooden, the wooden artifacts of the Taino people, the indigenous people of the Greater and Lesser Antilles. And, um, and so when she travels around, she takes her xylophone and she sends me these wood images, which those two may look similar to you, but they look very, very different to me. And that means that we can sample these things differently if we need to try to do a microscopic analysis and maybe preserve the material and not sample as harshly. So next steps, we want to finalize and disseminate the app. We want to get that out there and our identification models, have them available for people to use, whether for compliance or for enforcement. Um, we want to look at the ability to combine images from other devices, not just the Xylotron, which is highly controlled, or the Xylophone, but lots of other data sets, because if the, the more flexible we can be looking at the data, the better. And then uh, we would like to find somebody to mass produce these things, because I make them by 3D print them by hand. Well, not by hand, but I mean one at a time. And then I make them by hand. And it, if, I, if I don't screw up, it takes less than two hours. I'm a botanist. I usually screw up. It's more like a three-hour operation to, to make one. So and I, that doesn't scale very fast. And we want to get Xylotron, Xylophone technology into compliance and, and enforcement workflows. Now, just a quick thing, talking about wood identification, this is just one tiny, tiny piece, two little tools to contribute one little aspect of all this. This can't tell you where it came from. This can't match one individual to another. We're just trying to do general species identification. I think it's rosewood. Your paperwork's telling me it's pine, but you're smuggling rosewood. That level of field screening, field deployable. No single modality, whether it's DNA or machine vision or what have you, is going to identify every need. And different products have different underlying variability. There is no macroscopic hand lens level variation in paper. This won't ever do anything for paper. You can't get DNA out of paper. You can't get chemistry out of paper. The, the fluorescent stuff that made this fluorescent but not the sapwood is gone if you make paper out of this stuff. So those different forest products, even if the source material was something identifiable, depending on how we process it, can be less identifiable. And so you have to have, it, it's, it's, like, it's like anything else. You choose the tool that you need to solve the problem you actually have. Just because you have a hammer doesn't mean everything needs to be a nail. And ultimately, somebody has to collect the evidence in the field. They have to stop and check. That has to happen at the outset. So I just want to say thank you to all of my partners throughout the Xylotron, Xylophone stuff, the funding agencies, uh, the various people that have worked with me, but especially you guys for spending the time tonight. Um, I, I love this stuff. Very excited. I'm happy to take questions, of course. And, um, and, and stay and let you play with stuff and talk through whatever, so thank you. Please. So are the, are the 3D printer files available? In this, yes, they are. So, so in both publications for the Xylotron 2.0 and for the Xylophone, in the supplementary material of the publication, there's a set of STL files, step files for 3D printing. There's a set of uh, the CAD files that you need for getting the printed circuit boards manufactured. You can just send them off and get them done. And uh, everything, the parts list, it's all there. So the, the software right now for the Xylophone is not yet available because we're really in beta testing. And yeah, we have both Android and iOS. Yeah. Other questions? Hang on, Martin, I'll come right over. Thank you for this absolutely fascinating talk. You, you made a subject entirely foreign to me so interesting, so it was, it was really uh, very enjoyable. I have two questions. The, one is, 
wouldn't you think that this imaging technology and, and uh, you have developed is applicable, like you said, to many other materials? I mean, some are less uh, amenable than others because of less structural variation, as you have explained. So I wonder how, in which other fields you could ever imagine this to be applied. And the second question is, how would you, what do you think about the impact of this technology to empower governments to basically track down the illegal loggers because there's also um, this sustainability aspect, right? So you, you're probably on top of the sustainability agenda uh, when you think about uh, global deforestation, climate change, and all, all that jazz. So it has an, I think it has an enormous impact. So, so well, thank you for your, your kind comments first. Then let me <clears throat> take them in order. Um, when, we, when we first developed the Xylotron 2.0, um, we actually filed four provisional patents, not on the hardware, that's all open source. We want everyone to have that as freely and easily as possible everywhere around the world, anybody who wants it. That was the spirit of the project. That was actually part of the, the requirement of the funding from Department of State was that we, we put it out there, uh, freely available. Um, so so we, we had for a while a provisional patent for fabric identification, um, but I just, I'm not going to go become a textiles expert, um, and and I and I, I would love for someone else who is that expert to take this technology and do with it. That's why it's open for everything. Um, so we had that. We had it for veneers and plywood for charcoal, and the charcoal patent is going through. And there was a fourth one. I don't remember. But so yeah, it's it's really anything that has useful macroscopic variability. I mean, one of the things that's fun with the xylophone. The xylotron can do it also, but the screen is prettier on the xylophone. Is you can find the fluorescent, the fluorescent security strip in your in your twenty dollar bills, right, and scan across that. So you could use it for currency verification. You could not that there aren't easier ways to do that, but you can do uh, you can do lots of different things. I, that's the part of the reason to try to to work to make the xylophone in particular is to democratize access to this, to make this kind of, for one, again, hand lens evangelist. The world is unbelievably beautiful under a hand lens. So you should have one so you can just experience that every day because otherwise you're missing out. Um, so that, that part of it. But then also, yeah, I, I wouldn't pretend to say, who, who could do what with this? Because I'm, I'm just hoping people will take it, adapt it, <clears throat> change it, improve it, and use it in their application. That's, this is supposed to be a seed or a nugget that people grow into whatever they, they want for it. Uh, as, for, as for impact, um, yeah, I mean, Ghana has 14 xylotrons, one for each major forest management area. Uh, and it's part of their... part. Of, it, it, at least in 2018, when they were in my lab, we were working together and they went back. Um, they took 14 xylotrons with them and they were trained. We had four, four officers come from Ghana for several months, work with us, learn traditional wood identification, process things for machine vision, take the xylotrons back, and then go back and train human beings to do field identification. And then if the human beings didn't agree, with the, their human green didn't agree with the paperwork, then they would go get a xylotron from the office, check it against the paperwork, then take a sample, send it to a laboratory for a forensic level instead of a field level identification. So they were doing that in Ghana. There are 10 xylotron, charcoal xylotrons in the EU. Uh, we have systems in Peru, Colombia, Philippines. So there, there are places around the world that are trying to use this. And we're, I was just in Peru over spring break to do field testing with the xylotrons and the Peruvian model that we developed. So we're, we're working on trying to implement that. Um, but it's just, just me and like two other people. So <laughs> there's, only, there's only so much we can really achieve. Yeah. Uh, fantastic uh, storytelling. I think you have a lot to teach us about artificial intelligence, but I wonder, with your paradigm, are you going to have a dynamic Turing test, you know, Alan Turing, uh, so that w when a different species of wood comes up that fools your, your uh, limited knowledge, uh, that you can dynamically uh, account for that? So, so there are lots of yeah. So that's it's a it's a good question. The there are lots of ways that we can manage um, how the user interface reports results. 
right now we have it set to like, you know, kind of brutal honesty mode, right? So if you give it a picture of a duck, it's going to come back and tell you that it's red oak. And, um, and we could very easily just say, just report not recognized with any match less than a certain threshold, right? And so we could eliminate that. We could, uh, we are working on training models where we include a bunch of non-wood classes so that the computer kind of understands that there's things other than wood out there. Um, so in terms of like, like dynamic on the fly on the phone, probably not. Because the, the way we're doing things right now, we have, we have a fixed model based on images from reference specimens from the wood collection. And, um, and new images are not added into the model because the model has to be uh, actually calculated or determined on, on a, a great big fancy computer, right? A GPU with a couple, multiple GPUs you know, running to do this stuff, running overnight to generate a new model. So it, we, we don't have the, the wherewithal right now to have it changing on the fly. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Can and you that user the feedback, we question. Very, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that question? Oh, oh, that there are other other user modifications that could be made, like having the user uh, provide, you know, flag an image, let's say, as as being atypical or weird or something, or 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 say there are other. I'm sorry. Um, could you remind me? Okay, so to be able to add other features, like to, to have some kind of you know trigger pop up or say this this could be anomalous or this could be problematic, and then have that feedback come into us so that we can make those adjustments. Yeah, no, we're we're very interested in that. Online, Patricia Vega from the Wood Science Department at Oregon State. Do you think it would be possible to adapt this technology? to softwood identification. Right, so softwoods, softwoods, there are two basic kinds of wood out there, right? There are softwoods, which are things like pine, spruce, larch, Douglas fir, cedar, right, the, the evergreens. And then there are, you know, maple, birch, elm, oak, those are the hardwoods. They have fundamentally different, different wood anatomy. This is a, this is a CT scan through uh, a bristlecone pine log. This is a softwood. Um, so as for adapting these technologies, the, the macroscopic anatomical variation of hardwoods is up here. There's a lot to work with for wood identification. The macroscopic anatomical variation of softwoods is very low. So I can do very limited useful work with my hand lens and then with a softwood I almost invariably go to the microscope. The bulk of the anatomically or forensically useful detail of softwoods is microscopic, if you want it to be forensically reliable. So uh, we've, we've toyed with it a little bit, but it's not something that we're super excited about because there are so many more interesting kind of research problems and botanical problems to solve than just softwoods. I have two quick ones. Um, you mentioned a fast cut, or the, the, so do you have to prep that cut a certain way because you know you can have a chainsaw, you can have a handsaw. They would get very different uh, surface yep. properties. No, that's 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 a great question. So if we just have a piece of a piece of lumber, I just have a utility knife, and I just and now we can image that okay. done. Now that's not that easy to do in a field in the field. That's not that easy to do with a big bundle of lumber. So I just recently last couple months came up with a, a 3D printed sanding disc head, like the sander that we use in the laboratory, that you can chuck in a cordless electric drill, and then we use, we use Velcro-backed uh, sanding papers. And so you can, with that, you can go from 
uh, a really nice chainsaw cut, not a really ragged yeah. one, to a surface good enough to take a decent image in about 25 seconds. You, you know, bzzz, and then whip it off, put the next one on there, psh, spray, it, get the dust off, and you can image. So it's about, that's about the best we can do. So sharp knife or a you know drill and a portable sander. I'm glad we got that on video too. The sound effects. <laughs> Yeah, sound effects are mandatory, yeah. So the second one, you gotta educate me. I'm a DNA guy. Where do you get DNA when you have a piece of wood? Where, oh man. Where is it? So, so DNA, the D, okay. It's dangerous to ask questions. Um, okay, I don't have the slides here. Yeah, so most of the cells in wood are dead at functional maturity. So in the living tree, before we cut it down, and all those cells start screaming, right? The, the, only the sapwood is the living wood part of the tree. In that, most of those cells die when they grow up and join the workforce. They commit suicide as their final act of loyalty to the, to the greater good. Because if, if your job is to be a tube through which water flows, by definition, you have to be completely empty. You're only a cell wall devoid of any cytoplasmic contents. So there's complete, um, complete program cell death intentionally there, and that's true for many of the mechanical cells as well. So even in the living part of the live tree, the bulk of the cells are dead and without cytoplasmic contents. Then we cut the tree down, then we dry the tree out, we cut it into boards, we do all these horrible things to it, and all of these things tend to degrade DNA. But the DNA is predictably located in certain kinds of cells, the cells that are alive at functional maturity, parenchyma cells. So we use some wood anatomical knowledge to say, every time we cut or damage the cell wall, we release some of those extractives and chemicals. And a lot of those will inhibit PCR and, uh, and, and make it difficult to get DNA out of wood or to replicate DNA. So we want to do the minimum amount of me mechanical damage and maximize the greatest number of living cells and get the DNA out of that. So we have, we have two different approaches that we use for in the field. And then um, a colleague of mine at Mississippi State who was a postdoc in my laboratory, she and I just published a paper in the last year or so um, with a technique called organellar microcapture, where we're basically using um, a little micro injector like a vacuum, and we make little tiny um, like laser pulled quartz pipettes to go inside individual cells, grab a nucleus, take it out, put it in a tube, and then do DNA work on a single nucleus from a single cell. And that's not field deployable, not scalable. You have to be able to do the microscopy, you have to have all the equipment. We're the only lab that can do it probably because we have the right combination of expertise. But the thing that's exciting is a little tiny, tiny fragment of wood that normally wouldn't have been big enough for one DNA extraction. Now we can put it under the microscope. If I can visualize the nuclei, I can count them. And I can say, okay, I'm gonna give three to prosecution, I'm gonna give three to defense, and we're gonna keep the other 79 for appeals. And it would revolutionize the, the, the kind of the size of trace evidence that we could get DNA from. Sorry, long answer, yeah. Can you tell us about what the uh, video is on the screen. Oh, yeah, so this is, this is pretty cool. Um, so Dr. Bruce Allison, Allison uh, of Allison Tree Care and then over in the forestry department, um, got a hold of this, this piece of bristlecone pine. And do, does everybody know bristlecone pine? Bristlecone pine are, bristlecone pines are the oldest known unitary organisms in the world. So a non-clonal organism like you or me, right? You know, there's just one of us. It's not like you, you plant one of us and then little ones sprout up like sumacs do, right? Um, f over 5,000, 6,000 years old, some of these trees still alive and growing. So for thousands of years. This happens to be an arson victim, this tree. And he got a chunk of this and took it over to the med school and got them to do a CT scan. So what this is, is if I remember correctly, this is 1,504, I think, slices from one end of this log to the other. And then instead of having it be you know, stacked on you know, the, the, the Z axis, the up and down axis, is time here playing as a movie. So it's just looping. So it starts at one. So yeah, in, in this particular case, we've got, we've got cracks from the drying 
That was a whirl of branches. These are needle traces that are happening right now. And then if you watch carefully, there's, there's actually um, what, what they call spiral grain in a tree, which is like a heel. Instead of the cells growing straight up and down, they grow as a helix. And some of the growth rings will grow in a left-handed helix for a while, then others, then later will be in a right-handed helix. And so you can see some of these things seem to be turning, and they're not always necessarily turning in the same direction or at the same rate, which is pretty magnificent also. So this was just for fun. Involved with this? I'm sorry. Are there any fungi involved with this? With, with this in particular? Any other questions? That's an amazing video. Thank you for that description. I was watching that thinking, looks galactic. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Fantastic talk. <laughs>